Well, mindfulness is the word, in fact, is a translation of uh, a word sati, which is a, a Pali word. Uh, Pali is one of the languages in which the original Buddhist texts were written down. Um, uh, about two or three hundred years after the death of the, of the historical Buddha, as far as people can tell. And sati means uh, to be aware or awareness, uh, originally from a Sanskrit word meaning memory. But it doesn't mean, or say, uh, came to mean not the memory in some dra dragging things up from the past, but more memory in terms of awareness. As we might say to a child who is misbehaving in church, remember where you are. Um, well, we try to make the child behave by saying, remember where you are. Um, but when we say to a child, remember where we are, we're not saying to them, use your memory, in a sense, but a sense of becoming aw become, become aware of where you are or um, be mindful of where you are. So in that sense, mindfulness is about awareness, knowing uh, what you're doing as you're doing it. Um, and in that sense, it's really simple. But like most simple things, it's quite difficult to keep in mind. In fact, to remember to be mindful uh, is quite, turns out to be quite difficult. And uh, gradually it became used um, in the monasteries in Asia and cultivated as one of the hallmarks of uh, meditation practice. And the tradition spread um, largely because the merchants were going all over the place then and the writings of the monks or the early disciples of the historical Buddha um, uh, started to spread the word. Um, it was quite an egalitarian and rather anarchic sort of movement in one sense because it talked about um, being able to, as it were, ennoble yourself. It talked about there being four noble truths. Um, but they, uh, at a time when nobility was because of your birth, the idea that actually you could become ennobled by your practice, by your attitudes, by your behaviour, was really revolutionary. Um, and it was against the current of the time, but it spread very widely. Now, it's traditionally, as I say, cultivated by meditation practice. But in a sense, we all know that sometimes we're more aware and sometimes we're less aware. Sometimes we rush everywhere without knowing where we're going or where we've been. Um, we listen only with half an ear. We taste our food, or rather we gobble our food, perhaps without even tasting it, unless we've paid an awful lot of money for it at the <laughs> restaurant. And even then, John Teasdale, who's one of my co-authors on, on much of our work, uh, remembers a time when he went to a very, very posh restaurant, paying a lot of money for the food. It was so posh, they decided they could only afford to share the starter, uh, he and his wife. But when the starter came, it was like two little tiny bits of food on a big <laughs> plate, you know. Well, then you taste your food. But most of the time, food is actually quite difficult to, to taste. We just sort of gobble it down, and then we wonder where, where, where it went. Um, do you love anybody enough to give them their last Rolo was an advert a few years ago. And, you know, it would be all right if it really was the last Rolo. But actually, it's usually only the second one you're going to taste, because you tasted the first, and you know, all the middle ones usually go without even noticing. So uh, it's not really the last one at all, it's only the second one. Anyway, back to the talk. Um, awareness, non-forgetfulness, traditionally cultivated by meditation, and having two aspects to it, as all meditation does, a concentration aspect, a gathering of attention, a gathering together of what is usually dispersed and scattered. Concentration is perhaps the wrong word because it, it implies a sort of frowny sort of effort. It's actually more like calmly abiding with the present moment and to rest, and usually the meditations involve focusing on a single object and we often use the breath for that. And if the mind wanders, we invite people to come back to the breath without giving yourself a hard time. Not that meditation is about trying to clear the mind, but just notice that it's gone. The breath provides a sort of an anchor point. Um, and therefore you come back again and again to the anchor point. So you begin to see where the mind is pulling you to. If you didn't have the anchor point, then it'd be like sort of letting go of a kite. It would just go with the wind. With an anchor point, you have a sense of where the tug is on the anchor point, on the kite. And that's really useful, coming back all the time. And then, as well as the focused attention, there's wide awareness. There's the sense of being able, having trained your attention, to then become aware of the patterns of the mind, what tends to take you away, and 
um, what begins to ensnare us by, uh, as it were, entangling our minds in, as Rilke once said, entangling our minds in knots of our own making and struggling lonely and confused. He, he used those words in his poem, Gravity's Law. So from that cultivating the wider awareness comes sort of insight into the pattern of the mind. And so focused work and insight work, that's the nature of the mindfulness meditation. So how is it used? Well, John Kabat-Zinn started in 1979. He's a, an American, originally a molecular biologist, but he set up a stress clinic in the heart of a hospital in uh, New England, in, in Massachusetts, a place called Worcester, Massachusetts. And it's about the same distance from Boston as we are from Worcester here uh, in Oxford. And in a general hospital, he started to gather together a lot of these ancient meditation practices that usually you'd have to go to a monastery in Asia or to a retreat center up in the mountains. And he started teaching patients in chronic pain how to do this meditation. Um, he had some mindful movement and some yoga there. Um, he had people sitting on stools or on chairs, just focusing on the breath it turned out to be remarkably effective in allowing people to, to deal with or live around the edges of their chronic pain. So that was one movement away from the monastery into the discovery that there were ways in which you could put together um, a, a secular form of these ancient, what had become known as religious practices, although in the start of them they probably weren't religious in the way we understand it uh, at all. And it turned out very effective for pain, for stress. He did some research on psoriasis, that sort of skin condition, and found that just 10 minutes of listening to a meditation tape instead of listening to music actually got the clear-up rate going faster, significantly faster. And there were two randomised controlled trials on that. And in the, in the early 1990s, myself and my colleagues, John Teasdale, and Zindel Siegel from Toronto, um, uh, we were struggling to understand and to provide a new approach to recurrent depression. Um, it had become clear that depression, when you've had it, tends to come back. Um, and that although antidepressants work really well, um, they work only tend to work for as long as you're taking them. And when you stop, uh, although you don't get depressed immediately, it can come back. Of course, many people find it can come back even when you're still taking them. And so recurrence of depression became the, the big problem within clinical psychology and psychiatry. And we wondered whether this eight-week program that John Kabat-Zinn had, if it could be adapted by introducing some of the cognitive therapy principles that we knew worked when people were depressed, could we put them together? And that's what we did, finding something which we then called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. The cognitive therapy elements are relatively small, but the whole nature of the, the work is one in which we are uh, trying to bring together psychological science and this ancient wisdom, this ancient psychology as well uh, from Buddhism, to see whether bringing this ancient and modern together it could be effective. And I'll mention something about the effectiveness later on. The problem of depression is that once you've had it a few times, it tends to easily kindle. That means that although the first depression might have been due to a major, major thing happening in your life, like bereavement or separation or divorce or unemployment, um, that might be the first depression. Often it happens even before you've got to those sort of life events in childhood or adolescence. But once you've had depression, you don't need a big life event to trigger another one. And if you've had two or three, then it can be just come out of the blue. You can feel yourself down one morning and by the end of the day, you're feeling really really wretched. So it's now being used, mindfulness is being used not only in the clinic uh, but also in schools programs to help children to attend. There's work in Amsterdam on ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and for the parents of children with ADHD who are often very stressed, sometimes they had attention problems when they were young themselves, and it turns out that actually as adults they sometimes pro have problem focusing as well. So for the parents and the children with ADHD. Uh, uh, for health anxiety, we've just finished a trial on people that find themselves always worried about their health despite any reassurance from their doctor, and it seems to help there as well. 
and we're now starting projects with teaching midwives how to teach people who are expecting a baby how to be mindful and to, to approach the birth and the uh, parenting with, uh, with more mindfulness. This is not like natural childbirth, it's more like don't know childbirth. Um, uh, like you don't know what's going to happen and therefore how can you sustain a sense of being aware and to some extent in control in a situation in which you don't have very much control. Um, and uh, that's happening here at the uh, Oxford University Hospital, uh, what used to be called the John Radcliffe. Um, uh. So that's how it's being used. And the next thing, who is it for? Well, we've talked a little bit about schools and uh, people with attention problems, people with depression. But of course, you don't have to be clinically um, ill for mindfulness to be quite useful. Many people now find it's really helpful just as a way of checking in with yourself on a day-by-day -day basis. Because the world is, as we've said, so, so frantic, so hectic, that it's really easy to lose touch, uh, to live in our heads inst instead of to be aware of the contingencies and the, the life going on around us. Um, many of us find we lose interest in things um, or we get burnt out or stressed or depressed, we get restless or bored or we just rush, a, uh, rush around. And I think it's important therefore to back off a bit from all these clinical informations and to, to consider uh, what is the science um, that actually, what is it we know about how the mind works that gives us a sense of how mindfulness uh, operates. So I want to go now to how the science uh, uh, helps us understand. One of the most remarkable things about the mind is how even when you're not thinking very much, the mind is busy making associations, links between one thing and another. If you put people through a scanner and you ask them to do a, a simple task, you don't only see one part of the brain lighting up, you see whole networks of the brain lighting up. Now by the time the scans are analysed, you might see those pictures of the brain, maybe they've got a little dot there, um, and you think, oh, that's the part of the brain, but actually, oh, that's the bit that's lighting up most compared with other conditions. Actually, often the brain, the whole brain, or whole connections light up. And uh, these connections, these associations that we make all the time, are very useful to us. Um, we know about how context can bring back whole memories. A song, for example, that we know from the 1960s, if you're that age, the 1970s, the 1980s, I'll wait until people nod, 1990s, <laughs> um, how a song when you were first in love, for example, you can just hear it being played and it brings back a whole sort of, not just a memory, but a whole bodily feeling of what it was like to be uh, uh, in love for the first time or going back to a place you visited uh, that you lived many, many years ago. You perhaps can't remember um, that particular street uh, from outside, but when you go back there, then suddenly you think, oh, round the corner there was a... And maybe you're even right, that just being there brings back because those associations have now been activated. Um, associations can sometimes uh, actually fill in the gaps. Psychologists have done experiments in which they give you a list of words like uh, right, um, sweet, honey, white, cane, syrup. You read a list of words rather like that. And then they show you some words later on and they say, oh, now, which of these words were in the list? So sweet, sweet, cane, sugar, da, da. People say, oh yes, that was there, that was there, that was sugar. That was de sugar was definitely in the list. It turns out sugar wasn't in the list. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you've actually thought of it because of those associations between cane and white, and I mean, if I'd used the word spoonful, then you certainly would have thought it was in the, in the list, um, only due to Mary Poppins. Um, uh, so you, the associations build up, and it's as if you, you fill in the gaps. And that means that we can do a lot of things that take us beyond just the evidence. Uh, if I said to you, uh, Mary knocked the glass off the table and Jim went to fetch a broom, then an hour later, if I said what happened there, you'd say, uh, Mary broke a glass. But of course, I never used the word broke. But you'd swear that actually, you know, that is exactly what happened because as it were, we've created a model, a sort of narrative in our head based on the evidence we've got, and that model is what we remember. We don't remember the particularities, we remember the gist. 
and that means that we can throw away a lot of detail. But when we go for the gist of things, we don't even know we're creating these stories. We don't even know we're creating these because it happens so automatically. Until we are fooled by, like, the sugar type experiment, or by this sort of experiment. So if I give you a sentence, a series of sentences like this, John was on his way to school. He was very worried about the maths lesson. He didn't think he'd be able to control the class again today. <laughs> it was not part of a caretaker's duty. <laughs> and you see, you don't even know that you've got a model in your mind until suddenly it changes. And so we're making these inferences all the time, automatically, and they're very, very helpful. Sometimes, however, this going beyond the evidence gets us into problems, and that's when mood, either fearful mood or anxious mood or depressed mood, begins to do the inferential leaps for us. They fill in the gaps. And uh, so if we're walking down the street, for example, and we see somebody we know and... Um, we're not feeling too good that day, maybe, and this person just goes past without waving at us or acknowledging us in any way. Maybe we even went to start waving at them and, and they just walked past. What inference would come to mind then? Well, it would rather depend on the mood. What went through your mind at that time? You're walking down the street, you go to wave at somebody, they just walk past they didn't see me, yeah, yeah, fine, didn't see me, yeah, weren't wearing their glasses, they're full of Tesco's bags, preoccupied, oh, they were in the world of their own, yeah, absolutely. Have I, done something have I done something wrong? Exactly, yeah. what have I said to upset them? And do you see how that early automatic inference can be affected by whether you got out of bed one side or the other this morning, but once you've made one of those inferences, like they weren't wearing their glasses, or have I done something wrong, then it sends you off in a rather different direction. And after, if it's, have I done something wrong, maybe you start to wonder, well, what, what, I, what have I said to them something? And then you're thinking away, thinking away. You're probably missing people seeing you walking down the street because <laughs> you're now preoccupied. And uh, so there it goes on. But five minutes time, you think, oh, I won't stop for that cup of coffee. I'll just go home, maybe. No, I won't have that sandwich. I'll just, uh, yeah. The tendency to withdraw. And so these associations, which are so useful for us sometimes, going beyond the evidence to help us um, understand uh, what's going on in the world, can get us into, into problems, especially when mood begins to take things over. Associations are not just, however, just thought to thought to thought. That's useful. We understand what the word doctor means because the word doctor brings up nurse, hospital, you know, this sort of thing. But it doesn't just go from, it goes from thought to feeling. Well, we've done a bit of that with the walking down the street. But also the action tendencies. What do you feel like doing? Like when I said, I just feel like going home. I won't stop for that coffee. That's an effect of what's happening. And also the body, bodily sensations. They can become associated. So you have thoughts, feelings, body sensations and behaviour begin to get locked into these associative loops. And although, once again, this is very useful because uh, it sort of builds redundancy into the system, nevertheless, these loops are really important. Now, there are lots of experiments on the effect of the body on our judgment, and I'll just go through some of them because they're really interesting. Well, I find them interesting, but then I'm a, I'm a psychologist, so I would do... Um, but for example, okay, you set somebody up in an experiment and you give them a pair of headphones and you say you're doing a, a quality test of these headphones. So I want you to go to play you some music. I want you to uh, just look at the quality of the headphones. But people are going to use this when they're jogging. So to simulate jogging, I want you to move your head. And you tell half of the people to move their head like this. <laughs> and you tell the other half, unbeknownst to them, to move their head like this. Who do you think will rate the headphones as being better quality? <laughs> the nodders, absolutely. So there's one way in which just a simple head movement is, is associated with certain things. And, yeah, okay, thumbs up to these headphones. There's another one. Um, your, your, your perception is influenced by how fit you are. 
Okay, now this is, means that it's not just, like if I ask you to estimate the height of a wall, if I had a wall here, I just said, and you might tell me how high it is, or ask you to judge the height of a wall, uh, then one experiment was done on people who are just ordinary people, compared with people who'd learned how to run through urban landscapes. You've probably seen these people on the television, yeah? I think they're called traceurs or they or parkour. This is the, you know, they leap over this and they leap over that and from roof to roof and started in France. Can't think why. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, they, they learn to run through urban landscapes, sometimes through actual natural landscapes as well. Um, now, if you get these people, traceurs versus ordinary folk, to estimate, they think a wall is lower. They actually see a wall as lower than the rest of us do. Um, so uh, your perception is influenced by your, well, in technical term is, is affordance in psychology, the, your ability to do something in the world and your estimate of how easy it would be to do actually affects your, your perception, your visual perception of the, of the world. In fact, this is not only the height of a wall, your own height, your estimate of your own height is governed by how much in control you feel. So if you ask people to judge their own height, either their a real height or the height against a... a oh, there's a, yeah, okay. So if you put a spot here that's t exactly 20 inches above the height, the measured height of any one person, and then you ask them to stand back and say, how much lower or higher are you than that spot on the wall and the spots up there? then people will come out relatively accurately. But if you actually then tell some people in this experiment, now I want you to imagine, I want you to think back and remember a time when you felt really in control, where you had charge and responsibility. It might be when you were captain of your you know, girl guides team or something like that, or when you were in control of whatever it was. And then, now, how would you estimate your height? People actually think they're taller. But if you say to them, now, I, I want you to sort of remember a time when actually people were in control of you, where you didn't feel, uh, you know, where somebody was bossing you about and so on. Now, um, and then you ask them to estimate their height, they estimate themselves as shorter. Now, we've known for a long while that people who are taller tend to naturally do better in the world. So bishops are taller than the rest of the clergy. Did you know that? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> there we are. Somebody once told me that's because people are used to looking up. And so, um, so, but, so that's true. Bosses tend to be taller than their, the workforce, for example. Um, uh, uh, but what people are now discovering is that is something which actually changes depending on, you, you can change people's experimental conditions. So that's another way in which our body can influence our perception, or our body sensations influence our perception. Here's a third sort of experiment. Um, and this you could call a push-pull experiment. What you do is you give people a joystick and you ask people to respond to this experiment either by pulling it towards them or pushing it away from them. And all they've got to do is to look at some pictures on the screen. And you know sometimes you have things in landscape and sometimes in portrait. You know, they've got this, that's it, it's on word. You know, landscape, no, landscape, <laughs> portrait. All you've got to do is pull towards when it's landscape, push towards when it's portrait. Or, of course, in some conditions, you change it the other way around. So all you have to do is look at the shape, look at the shape. Look at, don't, you can ignore what's actually in the picture. Ignore what's in the picture. It turns out... If in the picture is a beer and you've got a problem with alcohol, you tend to pull it towards you quicker. <laughs> and you're slower to push away. You're slower to push away the beer. If it's soda, it's the other way around if you've got an alcohol problem. Or if you've got a problem with spiders and one of these pictures you're responding to is a spider, then you're quick to push it away, very slow to pull it towards. And of course, you're not pulling or pushing for a spider, you're just for landscape or portrait. That's the only thing you've got to respond to. The rest is all implicit. Now, psychologists have used, begun to use that by training people up, unbeknownst to them, to push away to alcohol instead of pull towards. And they find extraordinary that when they do alcohol treatment for people who have an alcohol problem, 12 months later, they get 10% better effects if they've just done four sessions of this extra training, learning to push away. So there's a way in which the body tendency to want to push away what we don't like or pull towards us what we do like is, as it were, hardwired in and can be observed in these psychological experiments.
And I think I'll give one more experiment, and then we better pass on. These are experiments that are um, take uh, subtle ways in which people frown or smile and then see the effect of that on their judgments. So it turns out if you wire up people's faces so that you can actually do very sensitive measures on which muscles are working and which are not working. You can wire people's face all around, and some of them just happen to be on the corrugator muscle, which is the frowning muscle. Others just happen to be uh, on the muscle there, which is the smiling muscle. And then you ask people just to, you know, just by moving the muscles of their faces, just turn the light on that's in front of them. So, and they don't know that what they're doing is very slightly frowning in one condition, or in another condition, to turn the light on, they have to very subtly smile, but they don't know quite they're using those muscles. They're either frowning or smiling, but they don't really know they're frowning or smiling. But then if you give them cartoons and you ask them to say, um, how funny do you think this is? Then when they're frowning, even though they don't know it, they don't think they're very funny. But if they're smiling, they do think they're funny. You can extend this in another way by doing experiment in which you ask people to um, hold a pencil between their teeth or between their lips, and if they ask them to hold it like this, or to hold it like this, then it makes a difference to how funny they think the cartoons are. Because... <laughs> so, uh, these associations then between thoughts, feelings, body sensations, those are, as it were, I said hardwired, but not all hardwired. Of course, they're, they, some of them are genetic, but most of them are built up over the learning history of the individual. You know, they are, they are learned associations. I don't think people are hardwired to like alcohol, but they certainly, many people, learn to like it um, and pull it towards or push it away. Now, this then relates very closely to what happens when we get down, when our mood goes down, when we're depressed or when we're anxious, because depression can activate any one component of that network and the other things will start up. The other things will start up. So, for example, if you wake up very early in the morning, well, you don't even have to wake up early, you know those moments when you wake up and you think it's Saturday and then you suddenly realise it's Monday or Tuesday? Isn't that the most disappointing thing in the universe? <laughs> Um, and, and your body's not, you know, you, you hope for another hour in bed, but you realise, ah. Oh. So your body's feeling very sluggish. In fact, there's a word for this sort of sluggishness that we all feel for the first few moments when we wake up. It's called post-sleep torpor. Um, post-sleep torpor, now you've got a name for it, I'm sure you'll... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll realise <laughs> that once you have a name for anything, it cures it. Um, uh, but post-sleep torpor affects all of us, and it just it varies in how long we experience post-sleep torpor. But it's that sort of twilight zone between sleeping and waking. But if you start your mind thinking when, you're f when your body's feeling that sluggish, the mind can soon actually begin to overestimate the effort of anything you're doing that day, what, you know, overestimate the difficulty of all your relationships, and it can begin to have an effect because of this close link between the body and the mind. It has a, a very tight control sometimes over what you think. And uh, you can see this again even in um, people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, when they have a flashback it's not the flashback that does the damage so much, though that can really you know, start the body, start the heart going, but that after the heart has started going, you start saying to yourself, why am I still like this? I should be over this by now. It's shameful that I'm so weak, and anybody who cries like this is completely off the, you know, crazy. And that fear, if it wasn't bad enough to have the flashback, that elaboration can make things worse. And if it wasn't bad enough to feel the body very sluggish, what we then say to ourselves can make it worse. In fact, there's nothing in this uh, world that is bad enough that the way we think about it can't make it even worse. Um, and that um, is uh, where we can, as it were, um, uh, begin to see the chinks, that we can begin to see the, 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 the bits of leverage, as it were, where psychological approaches might help us to relearn associations or even begin to float these things apart so we can see thoughts just as thoughts, like clouds in the sky, rather than feeling ourselves being sucked into them. 
that we can, uh, when we see our body beginning to react with very clutched up or contracted, we can actually just notice the body just as body sensations and prevent it from cycling back into the thoughts. Because when we bring awareness to any automatic association, it de-automatizes it. When we bring awareness to any link, any automatic link, it de-automatizes it. So it means that we have a bit more space between thoughts, feelings, body sensations, and behavior. Well, we've used quite a lot of examples from um, uh, uh, experiments, but it's also quite useful to think of examples from our own sort of experience and uh, uh, from our own daily life, hence the sort of sluggishness in the morning. The point about the sluggishness in the morning is that the, the, because it activates thinking, and thinking then has an effect on the body, and then that has more act effect on thinking. It, the mood can feel like it's getting worse and worse by itself, but actually this, it's this loop that's actually dragging us down. It's the, it's the activated loop. I mean, if you don't believe me, then just, well, focus on how tired you are right now. I mean, I don't want you to get as sluggish as you are on a, on a Tuesday or Monday morning, but if you just close your eyes and focus on right now how tired or awake you feel, just how tired or awake you feel right now. And just tune in to the level of tiredness, maybe on a 10-point scale, how tired you feel right now. If, if 10 was as tired as ever and naught was feeling very energetic. And then try saying to yourself, I don't want to feel like this. Why do I feel like this? What's it say about me that I feel like this? I wish I wasn't feeling so tired. And then open your eyes. And now how do you feel? Less tired or more tired? More tired? Yeah. And that's a very interesting observation, because there, in that little tiny experiment, all we did was suggest a few simple questions which are not themselves tiring. So to ask, why am I feeling this like this? Or even to say, I wish I didn't feel like this. That itself is not a tiring question to ask. And yet, just sort of seeing the gap between how you're feeling and how you would like to be feeling is enough to actually make you feel more tired. So you can see how the tiredness is getting worse, so at that moment, you might redouble your efforts to say, oh, my gosh, why do I feel like this? Oh, I, did, I wish I didn't feel like this. Oh, I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. And just, oh, yeah? <laughs> so uh, then you, and, and actually, it, it feels naturally as if your body is naturally getting more tight. You don't realize it's what is the thoughts going through your mind at that point that actually is driving the mood at that point. But if we know it, we can begin to recognize it. So how then does mindfulness help? This gets us to uh, the last of our, of our questions. If we can see these patterns of associations between thoughts, feelings, body sensations, and our impulses to act, then, as we said, it de-automatizes it. Maybe we ought to try the experiment again with the tiredness, but this time I'll ask you to do something different. So again, if you close your eyes, And just sit there and notice where, whatever, however you're feeling in terms of tiredness, notice where in the body it's coming from. And seeing if it's possible to be curious about where in the body it is. Where are the raw sensations, the physical sensations, and seeing if it's possible to notice them without any judgment. <laughs> Allowing them to be just as they are. Not trying to get rid of them, just allowing them to be just as they are, seeing them clearly. There may be tension in the shoulders, <coughs> a heaviness in the stomach, whatever. Just allowing it to be 
felt without trying to get rid of it. And a sense of friendliness towards the body as best we can. And now allowing the eyes to open and taking in the room again. Now, that's quite a difficult experiment to do, but how did you feel when you were curious about what your body was doing? Yeah, relaxed? Yeah, a bit more relaxed. Did you find the tiredness getting worse and worse and worse as you did it? That may have happened, of course, but how did you find? No. Just no, okay. Now that's itself interesting because I was inviting you to focus on your body and you might have thought that if I focus on my body when I'm feeling tired, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. But by focusing on the body rather than the thinking, actually it gives you somewhere else to be. You can focus on the body as it is, and bringing curious and friendliness to the body can actually send you off in a different direction. So that's a little bit of what mindfulness does. It allows us to deal with um, what we normally think of as being sort of like, I don't want this, push it away, don't like this. Um, well, often when we see ourselves pushing away, like the person on the joystick, it turns out that it doesn't work. If we try to suppress thoughts that we don't like, for example, it might work for a little while, but then it comes back. Somebody's done a whole series of experiments on what they call the white bear test, which is, I mean, it couldn't even be a white bear, it could be a pink elephant. The instructions are simple. Don't think of a pink elephant for the next minute. <laughs> yeah? Guess what happens? Yeah. And uh, white bears, pink elephants, whatever, suppression doesn't work. What we resist often persists, actually. Um, and, so, and yet, it's what we do most of the time when there's things we don't like. Um, of course, if there's fluff on the carpet, we can get a hoover out and hoover it up. But when we have a thought we don't like, it won't easily be hoovered up in that way. Um, and that, uh, it can actually sometimes create even more mayhem. But when we've stopped doing this, if we find the worry keeps coming back, we start to actually think about it. We start to try and over elaborate it. And mindfulness is really good at giving an alternative to the, the mind that tends to elaborate. It spots the time when we're going beyond the evidence, as we said with this, John was on his way to school. We begin to see things moment by moment just as they are. And of course, the mind will go off on one. It often does. But we, we've got more capacity for seeing that too. I was in Amsterdam last week and at Schiphol Airport, I don't know if you've been to Schiphol Airport, but to get down onto the railway at Schiphol, they have these long walkways, a moving walkway. There was a guy in front of me and he had one of these wheelie cases that has four independent wheels. That would have been fine, but he had another wheelie case and a third backpack. And attending to all meant that he lost control of the big wheelie cases and it set off in front of him. <laughs> he set off after it, leaving his other backpacks on, but this thing gathered speed going up, went onto the Schiphol platform underneath the uh, airport where the trains were sort of coming and going out, and only when I got down did I realise his panic and he was running after it because it had tipped over the edge onto the platform was now lying between the rails. And so he looked at me, I looked at him, and we looked whether there was a train coming, and then we looked to see if there was an electric wire, and we, th we saw there wasn't an electric wire. And, uh, and then the train was due in two minutes, and they tend to be on time in Amsterdam. Um, and, you know, praying for network rail, but, you know. Um, <laughs> and in the end, he said, shall I go for it? I said, OK. Um, there's no, nobody in authority around. He dashed down, got it, came up. And he realised then he had missed his train because it was one going from the other platform. Um, uh, but I knew instinctively, as you would it, what was going on in his mind probably for the next few hours. Not just the horror of that, but the horror of what if. And we know that when people have an event like that, often the event itself is bad enough, but we surround it with a whole network of, oh, what if? What if the people train had come in? What if I'd jumped out? What if there'd been an electric rail there? What if actually I hadn't got up in time? What if the train had come in? What if the train had had an accident? What, you know? 
And almost the what-ifs can be as damaging for our sense than the actual thing itself. Mindfulness doesn't change anything in, in life in one sense, but it helps us to see the difference between events and the what-ifs, or between events and the if-onlys, because that's what we do for the past, of course, not the what-if had happened, but also if only I hadn't done this, if only that relationship, if only that person, if only I, if only I'd taken that decision in life. And the sense in which we can torture ourselves with these things are uh, able to be seen clearly in mindfulness. Well, we've got time, I think, for one last short meditation and then a little bit speaking and then we'll have questions. Do you want to do one short meditation? Yeah? Okay. Um, so for this, again, if you um, just sit down, um, you can come away from the back of the chair if you wish, but if you want to lean on the back of the chair, that's also fine. And the feet flat on the ground. And we'll do a, a short two or three minute uh, breathing. And just notice what happens in the mind and in the body. So allowing the eyes to close if you feel comfortable with that, or just lowering the gaze. If you want to sit this out and not, um, not do it, that's fine. Nobody knows. It's the thing about meditation. Nobody can tell if you're doing it or not. <laughs> so sitting here and becoming aware of the body's contact with the chair and with the feet on the floor hands on the lap. The spine is straight but not stiff, strong back. The shoulders relaxed, the head and neck balanced. Aware of any thoughts going on in the mind. Not trying to change anything, simply noticing what's, what's around right now. Any feelings? Any sensations in the body? And then at a certain point, just shifting the focus of attention, gathering it and focusing on the breath. Maybe noticing the sensations of the breathing down in the abdomen. The rise of the abdomen wall on the in-breath, the falling away on the out-breath. See if that's true for you. So we're not trying to control the breath, simply allowing it to breathe us. And if the mind wanders, as it might do, in fact, probably will, as soon as you notice where the mind has gone, acknowledge where it went, and very gently escort the attention back to the breath. That's what minds do. They tend to wander, and we're not trying to clear the mind. We're just trying to wake up when it's gone, gently bring it back to the breath. And as soon as the mind goes, bringing it back. So if it goes a hundred times, just bringing it back a hundred times without giving ourselves a hard time. and then shifting our attention for the final time, and this time expanding the attention to the body as a whole, as if the whole body was breathing now, aware of all the sensations in the body, from the crown of the head to the bottom of our feet, and right out to the surface of the skin. And as best we can, allowing the body to be just as we find it, not trying to relax or make it different from how we find it. Allowing it to be as it is, allowing ourselves to be as we are. A sense of coming home to the body. And then when we're ready, beginning to move fingers and toes, allowing the eyes to open and taking in the room again. (coughs) 
So that's a bit of a flavour of the meditation practice that we teach people to do over eight weeks. Um, people can do it online by going to Be Mindful online <coughs> if they want to, and uh, that's the Mental Health Foundation's website, bemindful.co.uk. People can use it, books and CDs, or they can come to class for eight weeks. Uh, we run public classes, but there are lots around now that run eight-week classes. Um, does it work? Well, our research has found that it halves the rates of depression. It's as good as antidepressants, but we're not trying to criticise antidepressants. So many people find them lifesaver, and no one should ever go off their pills without telling their doctor anyway or asking their advice. But it's good to know that there's something else we can do um, for those who don't want to be taking um, pills or medication. Um, as I say, it's good for health anxiety and lots of other uses now. Um, all our academic papers are on our website, oxidmindfulness.org, or oxidmindfulness is one word, .org. Um, and indeed, this video um, that's being made tonight will be on oxidmindfulness.org in about a week's time, but also Science Oxford Live, scienceoxfordlive.com, I think it is, isn't it? Scienceoxfordlive.com both has this talk on it, or will have, and uh, any follow-up information that you want. So... I think, just to summarise, mindfulness is, has a long, long history. Um, and, and yet, it can also be applied to the very, very modern um, uh, ways of living that we get ourselves locked into. And what's lovely is to find people from the East coming over here and rejoicing in what we're doing, and then sometimes going back to the East and being able to learn more about what they're doing as well. Some things happened over the last 20 or 30 years in which this is now dispersed. It's available. And uh, it's been one of the uh, loveliest things in my scientific career to have the opportunity to be a researcher and a scientist researching something which is also of practical value and can be taught to people and that many people find can help them in, in ways that are often surprising but always delightful, this cultivating compassion for the self and for others, treating yourself more kindly. And when it works, we know from our science that it works because people have learned to treat themselves more kindly. And with that, I'll stop the talk and take any questions you have. Thank you for your attention. your question into the microphone just to make sure that everybody can, can hear you. Um, so who would like to answer the first question? Just raise your hand. Um, during your talk, um, um, you um, sounded like you exchanged the word mind and then brain as if they were sort of like synonymous. <laughs> and um, from my studies of sort of Eastern religions, um, the mind is, uh, I think, well, <laughs> um, not so sort of um, not regard, not regard. Yeah, um, the mind. So I'll repeat the question for you, if you like. So the mind and brain aren't synonymous. Yes. Indeed. So exactly so. So um, and actually, not just. Eastern religions that teach that. I mean, um, we also teach it in psychology. So, uh, but you're absolutely right that because now we have the technology to look at the brain, people, psychologists get very excited about that. So some of us are neuroscientists and we just love looking at what happens when people do things. Um, on the other hand, they can tell us everything and they can tell us nothing. So for example, if we look at a person's brain um, uh, who's got a memory problem, we'll not see the memory center light up and we might say, ah, that's because they've got a problem with their memory centre in the brain. But of course the reality is they're not remembering at that time. You don't know actually what came first. Maybe they're not remembering because they don't want to remember something. And because they don't want to remember it, they're not remembering it, and therefore that part of the brain's not lighting up. So you're quite right to say that we can't swap them about. Um, the other thing is that 
the best way of seeing the brain, I think, now is it's um, like a, a, a repository for our experience. But our experience comes from our body in interaction with the world, our selves in interaction with other selves, and our whole sense of self, unlike what Descartes said, which was actually the, the self is, as it were, the bit that he can be certain about. But as philosophers have said since then, actually, the reason why he's got a sense of I at all is because of his interaction with other people. So it's an interaction with other people, other bodies, other minds, other objects in the world that explains our full nature of self. Um, that's another <laughs> lecture altogether, I guess. But I think your observation is quite right. And if I use them interchangeably, then that's my mistake and I shouldn't have done it. Mm. How do you define mind, then? Oh, how do I define mind? <laughs> OK. Well, I would say um, that, let's say the conscious mind is um, uh, the awareness of our moment-by-moment -moment experience. That, But we also have to look beyond just what we're aware of, because much of the mind is working, as it were, behind the scenes. So, for example, there's all sorts of things you're remembering to do tomorrow and the next day, which you're not thinking about now, but tomorrow you'll do them. So the mind is actually storing all these things up. They're not, they're, as it were, not unconscious, but they might just as well be for now, but they're going to be retrieved at some point. So the mind has to encompass our conscious awareness, but also all the store of things that you've done in the past, but also you intend to do in the future. It's your sense of orientation in time and space. Your mind gives you that for nothing, actually. And it's tragic when that just orientation in time and space goes, and we need 24-hour care. Many of us will end up you know, with dementia because that's what will happen. We'll lose something which at the moment we just take for granted, which is our orientation in time and space and our, and our memory. So I see the mind as a multi-layered thing, but always in interaction with other people and other things in the world. We can't think of the mind as an isolated entity. Thank you. There's a question there, I think, and one there. And <coughs> Well, you can both shout and use the microphone. <laughs> I was just wondering if you think that um, mindfulness is, um, as it is here, a, a reinvention of Buddhism mm. within the scientific community in the West. I think there's a, a lot of wisdom in what you say. It is, it's, it's a secular form of meditation, but it's, it's been cultivated most... Um, intensively, I think, within Buddhism. Um, though, actually, when you get to virtually all religious traditions have a contemplative or a meditative tradition. Um, so the, the Ignatian tradition, for example, or the Carmelite tradition in Christianity, there's the Sufi tradition in Islam. Um, there's many of what we call Hinduism, Indian religions, which, actually, which were here before Buddhism, of course. There are Chinese, ancient Chinese, there's Taoism and Confucianism. Many of them, are, they're different in many ways, but they all have practical implications. And you might think of actually the, the West as having been a deviation from the norm of actually inventing a, a philosophy which is about thinking alone often, or about logic alone, or reason alone, because Greek philosophy was about practice, about practical wisdom, for example. And they had their schools, and they had their, their masters and their disciples, and you could see the original Buddha as one of those schools, a master and their disciples. Uh, they proliferated three or four hundred years BCE. Um, gradually, as the practice spread, it was taken up by the cultures and religions of the, of, the, of the Far East as they spread. And it became what we now know as religion. But in the East, they don't distinguish between the secular and the sacred. That's a bit of a Western invention, really. Um, so I think... Um, what you're pointing to is absolutely right, that um, now, as the Dalai Lama has said, um, people won't get what they need by becoming Buddhists. If meditation and mindfulness is useful for people, then we need the research, scientific evidence, to demonstrate that, and then it will be in the medical curriculum and the school's curriculum, not because I, as the Dalai Lama, say it should be, or because they've got Buddhism, but because it actually works and it's effective, and that's what the science can teach us. And the remarkable thing is when I was in Vietnam talking with some people at Hanoi and people from Thailand and India there, it was interesting that they were quite interested in the science because their government, which is a secular government, is, is trying to make their, their medicine evidence-based. 
And so they're sort of, they would tend to turn away from their religious aspect because that seems a bit um, old-fashioned. But to actually say, actually, this is evidence-based. Here is something, a gift you've given to us, that actually we can give you the gift of some of our evidence, if that's useful for you, back to you so you can actually use it in your hometown where it came from. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Like and I know there's been various, ex not experiments, mm. but um, yeah, there's been research done. So I wonder whether you can give us a, a, a little bit of understanding about what they may have... Um, what they found. What they found. Yeah. Like those, those people who practice yeah. mindfulness or meditation on a regular basis. Absolutely. So there are various strategies for neuroscience. One is to take monks who have been practicing for years and years and years and see what their brains look like. And it's very interesting because... You can get patterns there. For example, the centers that we know about body sensations that are activated with compassion, for example, when you show compassion for something, or where you show empathy for something, they're almost off the scale uh, with the monks. Now, of course, that's only one strategy, and it's not enough, because they might have been like that as children, and that's why they chose the path they did. So we can't necessarily tell. But then you can set up experiments where you ask people to... to um, to go through an eight-week or you, you test people before and after they've learned to meditate, you find not that great scale of change, but you find changes in exactly the same area of the brain. So that experiment would be the tiredness. If you do that with people before they've ever meditated, you tend to see all the parts of the brain to do with thinking and body sensations all lighting up. But after eight weeks of meditation, you get the body areas lighting up, part of the brain called the insula, which is associated with body sensation and body awareness, but not so coupled tightly to the thinking part of the brain that normally just goes round and round in thought. It's not that the thinking can't happen, but the sort of an uncoupling uh, goes on. That was some data first came out in 2007 from Toronto, from the lab in Toronto. That's, so that's another strategy, do a before and after and have a control group who, who don't do it. A third strategy is to just measure how mindful people are in their life and uh, because there's a questionnaires you can use. Like some people rush around all the time. They never taste their food. They only ever listen with half an ear. Sounds like us, really. Um, but some people are really intense on that scale. Other people are, are much more naturally mindful. Uh, put them in the scanner and see what, how their brains differ on that scale. The frantic sort of rushing around or the people that have got a few more, a bit more mindfulness in their lives naturally. And what you find is the people who are rushing around tend to have an amygdala which is this sort of the fight and flight part of the brain, which is like overactive. It's pretty chronically overactive. If you then ask them to do a task where they're trying to, say, judge emotional faces, then there's a big spike. And if they're less mindful, the spike is higher. But the height of the spike is completely accounted for by the, the chronic overactivity. So the spike, although it looks very high and very alarming, actually, if you statistically remove the overactivity, the spike so, as it were, disappears. So it seems to be that the amygdala is like stuck in the on position for people that... And, and often people say, I'm rushing because I'm being creative. This is me at my most creative. I think that's probably... As far as their brain is, they're running away from a tiger in their brain, even if they think they're being creative in their life. Yeah. Um, and the fourth strategy for neuroscience is to actually measure using EEG or a MEG, which actually looks at electrical activity from near the surface of the brain by just wiring up to measure very, very... Uh, Ch changes in, um, in electrical polarities in the surface of the brain. And you can find difference in, between right and left. So when the right is more active than the left, people tend to be in this pushing away mode. When the left is more active than the right, people are in the more pulling towards mode. And what happens through mindfulness, and I've done <coughs> research, Richie Davidson from Wisconsin has done some research to find that once people have gone through an eight-week course, then the left gets more prominent. People are more approach orientated. And they even maintain that when they're feeling sad. So you can do a mood induction experiment in which you actually teach people how to, you know, do you give them very sad music, to, you know, listening to sad music. We use Prokofiev. Um, <laughs> um, and 10 minutes of Prokofiev really makes people feel sad if you, if you choose the right music. Now, the interesting thing is this experiment, you can see the sadness. In this experiment, normally you'd see sadness and a lot of, don't want sadness, don't want sadness, a lot of right frontal activity relative to left. The people who've been through mindfulness feel just as sad, but
but they're able to maintain the sense of approaching, the sense of not trying to push it away. And we know clinically that that's really important <coughs> because if you don't try and push it away, it's actually more likely to go by itself. If you can have the courage to stay with it a little longer, it tends to float away by itself. Not always. Sometimes you might just need to do something you know, that you know to do. Generally it does. So that's how the neuroscience, different ways in which the neuroscience is helping us understand. Thank you. There's a friend of mine who went to a, to a nunnery once, and there was a nun there digging the garden. And uh, he asked her, what are you doing? Ho hoping she was going to say, I'm planting vegetables, or I'm planting beetroot, or I'm planting leeks, or whatever. And she said, I'm meditating. I'm, I'm meditating as I do this. And the intention of my meditation, and she named somebody. I'm doing this for. And she was actually doing the gardening, as it were, as an act of love for herself and for this other person she was holding in mind. And I think that sometimes we can often get hooked into, there must be a right way to do this, and usually I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> so one of the things is that we all tend to give ourselves a bit of a hard time, yeah? And that we say, right, unless I meditate this often, this time, this much, then, uh, I'm letting myself down, or I'm letting God down, or I'm letting the Buddha down, or I'm letting myself or whatever down. So one of, the, one of the things that we're sometimes able to do is to see if we can hear those voices in the head and to let ourselves off the hook a bit. So for example, if we feel that we'd like to meditate more often, well, how often? And would it be helpful, for example, to set ourselves something to do, say, for a month. So I'm going to focus on just my, the breath at the tip of my nose for a, for a month. Something where you can really investigate something rather than just, right, I'm going to sit and, and then, of course, what happens is the mind, I don't know if your mind wanders, my mind wanders. Um, and then we can often feel, oh, this isn't working, <laughs> you know, restless, boredom. So, so one of the questions is, if we give ourselves just one thing to do, just for a few moments, because often it's not how long we stay that's important, it's actually getting there. Some yoga teachers say that the hardest move in yoga, the very hardest move in yoga, and you're thinking already, is it that one or is it that one? <laughs> the hardest move in yoga is the move onto your mat. <laughs> and the hardest move in meditation is the move onto your cushion or into your chair. And if we learn to do that every day, every week, however often it is, and just once you're there, then decide how long you're going to stay. Because... Five minutes, ten minutes, who knows? Quarter an hour, half an hour. There's something about the everydayness of it which helps us, as you've found. But when it fades, if we're able not to give ourselves too hard a time, it's much more likely to come back. Whereas if we start saying to ourselves, oh, there I go again. <laughs> yeah? Then it might be weeks before we come back to it. If you say, oh, okay, not now, not today, but maybe tomorrow, and just see if there's a lightness of touch about it, then... Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Mm. Thank you. We have time for just one more question. Um, uh, just thank you. <coughs> can, I, can I just add to what you just said? Mm, um, please. For that lady, there's a Vietnamese Buddhist called Thich Nhat Hanh, mm. I'm sure you're aware, and he's mm. written various books yeah. where uh, he's particularly keen to express that you can be mindful when you're washing up, yeah. when you're walking, when you're doing everything. And it's mm. very simply written. So I recommend you get one of his books. Yeah. And the other thing is, I personally have benefited from mindfulness. I come from a Tibetan mm. background, mm. and I wear a red string that's been blessed by the Karmapa, but mm -hmm. you could have anything that you always have on your body. Mm. When you find that your thoughts are going off in a negative way, mm. I grab my red string, uh -huh. 
and bring my thoughts back to how I'm causing mm. my own suffering. Mm. And it works every time. It's amazing. <laughs> well, there we are. Over 10 years, I've found that that helps. So get yourself a cue to <laughs> attach to and become mindful mm. of where your thoughts are going. And Pema Chodron says that um, you... When you see a thought that you don't want, or when you're doing mindfulness meditation, you just label it thought mm. and let it go. Mm. Yes, and indeed. It can come back more easily. Absolutely, absolutely. There's something about the labeling of thoughts, just as thoughts or feelings and so on, which can be very empowering. And, and I agree with Thich Nhat about everything can be a mindfulness exercise. And, then, and, and, and for many of us, you know, a bit of every day taking ourselves away just to be by ourselves can help can help that. Um, Christina Feldman, great mindfulness teacher, once said that being mindfulness is, is actually quite easy, but remembering to be mindful is really <laughs> difficult. So it's actually these reminders. So thank you very much for that. And thank you all. And I think we can see around. Thank you.